So good to see kids in the house, young people in the house. Amen. We got a new baptized believer up in the house. Amen. Amen, Sister Kim. I see Brother uh, the Apostle Blunt back there, a new author in the house. Amen. And Sister Blunt back there. Amen. And the wards back there. I forgot what you look like, Sister Ferry. Amen. <laughs> I think, is that Bria Hillier back there? Y'all, I want y'all to give Bria a hand, serving our country all the way across the seas. Amen. United States Air Force, thank you for your service. We appreciate it. Amen. And so many other people. Didn't I see Nan? What Nan in the house? Nan, you got that hat on high. Amen. <laughs> Sister Connie and Reverend Perry, all right, all right, well, it's good. It's good to be in the house of the Lord yet again. Amen, amen. So, I just feel good seeing you all here. You just don't know. You just don't know. I thank God for Zoom, but that virtual ain't the same as the actual. Reverend Carter, the virtual ain't the same as the actual. We all in here, we all alive. There have been many 
That's right. That's right. That's right. We're here. She made a good point. We've made it through this far. We've come this far, not by our intellect, not by how much money we have, not by how smart we are, how good we look. We came this far by faith, leaning on the word, trusting in his holy word. He's never failed me. I don't know you about you, but he's never failed me. I failed him, but he's never failed me. Amen. All right. Well, it's preaching time. <laughs> it's preaching time. It's preaching time. You know what? It's such a blessing because there still are a lot of churches who haven't come back together in the sanctuary. And so I'm very grateful for the process that we have. And I know some people wonder what all they have. We're going to just keep our process going for a minute, everybody. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing for a little while. And so, you know, if you, you, if you want the people throwing your mask away, keep it for Sunday service. <laughs> Amen. And if you want to get, get jiggy with it, you can get different colors and styles. And I see some stylish masks right out there right now. Amen. Amen. So, but anyways, we're going to keep doing that because everybody is fascinated. Amen. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to continue to keep uh, people safe who come to this church to worship. And we appreciate our, our, our usher and health unit ministry working through this time. I thank you all for your patience for them. Because I'll be honest with you, when we had these funerals, people were not obeying the ushers. They were giving them, and at that time, it was a risk. People didn't want to obey the ushers. They didn't want to obey the health unit. Some folks didn't want to wear their masks. And so it was tough for them. And so I appreciate them being faithful as well as the deacons uh, throughout all this. And, and our praise team and our music ministry, I want to say I appreciate them and Brother Terrell, uh, uh, our media team who've been here throughout all of this. And it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to serve this congregation. And it's not been a burden. It's been a pleasure to do God's will during this pandemic. Because I know everybody couldn't do it our way, but we had to do it the way God told us to do it. Yeah. Amen. Amen? We had to do things the way the Lord said work for New Northside. Yeah. Amen. All right. So we've been working through our series about uh, uh, our vision and purpose. So we understand why we're here, what we're doing, where we're going. That's why we've been working through this. Because January 6th told us some people didn't understand the Constitution. They understand what they're supposed to be doing in a democracy. And we don't want to be like that. Because we have a calling beyond the Constitution. We have a commission that Christ himself gave every person who would be a believer. Everybody's been commissioned. And so our vision statement is restoring our community by restoring our relationship with God and through Jesus Christ. And we're on part 10. And we're on our methods. So last week we did part one on our methods. Methods to carry out the vision and purpose. Now we're on part two. And so I already did an abundant greeting. So now we're going to go to the text. So if you're able, stand on your feet. If you're able, to honor the word. They were so excited because they stood on their feet down at Bush Stadium for the national anthem. And at the blue, at Savage Center, was it, was it Savage Center? Is it Enterprise Center? Anyway, wherever the blues were playing, people stood on their feet for that flag. And so we're going to stand on our feet, if you're able, for this flag right here. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds there, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Grace Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit remain present. Dear Lord, we pray that, Lord, that we will be blessed by your words and your message. Uh, dear Lord, we pray that uh, you will be glorified by the preaching of your word. Dear Lord, I pray that you allow me to be of some use at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. 
So, this scripture talks about the fundamental building block of communities and societies. The fundamental, the most basic building block of any society is the family. It's the most organic. You can't, it's the family. See, if it was just individuals or single people, then it would never grow. If no one ever has children, then it would never grow. There'd never be any future generations, you see. And God ordained, blessed, commissioned the family. See? Now, here's what we know. We know that because of sin, sin made it. So after God put Adam and Eve in the garden, and after sin came into the world, difficulties came. Sin brought a wedge between man and woman. Sin brought in difficulty and trouble in bearing children. And we, we see even the next story after Adam and Eve is about sin in family relations came in Abel. But here's the thing. Despite what happened with sin, God never withdrew the blessing upon man and woman, upon families, upon humans called to be stewards over the earth. Now you see that word dominion in people. Dominion is root word of dominate. But God called us not to dominate this world, but to have stewardship take care of it, make it better. He never withdrew that blessing, friends. And that's why anywhere all over the world, there's weddings going on right now. And people are happy. They may not be Christians, they may be whatever, Hindu, but there's joy because that's a blessing, a common grace blessing that God gave across the world. And then when a child comes forth, that's a common grace blessing that God has never withdrawn. That's his blessing. But then we look at the Bible, the, the, the history, the, the reality is the stories in the Bible, are, uh, it's a history of family disharmony, starting in the very beginning. The beginning of sibling rivalry, you see in the very family, sibling rivalry and broken families. Then when you get to Genesis 16, God promised family to Sarai and Abram, he wasn't Abraham at that time, but she didn't believe it and she engineer some stuff and it was some more family dysfunction Isaac and Rebecca played favorites with their twins see played favorites people say oh Pastor Burton oh you gonna love you gonna be a daddy I was very careful because of the scripture not to play favorites because it's, it's, it's problems when you play favorites. And human beings, naturally, you're going to have some child, grandkids, somebody that you like more. But you ain't supposed to do that. They play favorites. Jacob conned his brother. See? You got all these stories about broken relations, but yet despite our familial disharmony, discord, Disputes in family relations, God's desire is still for shalom or peace in the family. That's God's desire for us. No matter how dysfunctional of a family situation, God's desire is that there still be peace with that family. So much so that God left the path to mercy and we see it would happen with Cain. See, it's funny. Uh, you'll see God will give a word of encouragement and a warning and an opportunity to Cain to learn. What am I talking about? Genesis 4 and 1. Now Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And then she bore again and this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, sheep herder. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. He's a farmer. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought, and then you get a long description here because it shows you how much thinking that Abel did in bringing this offering. Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. So you got Cain brought something, whereas Abel brought the best to God. 
And so it says, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. He respected Abel's offering. And he respected it. But Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. And so the Lord said to Cain, so, so look, he, he's talking to Cain. Why are you angry? Why is your countenance falling? Here's the encouragement. If you do well, will you not be accepted? By who? By God. Who's talking to him? And if you do not do well, here's the warning. Sin lies at your door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So after what happened to Adam and Eve, even though God had given them a pre-warning and they disobeyed, this time around, God directly warns Cain and says, look, sin, the devil wants you to mess up right here. But then, what happens? What does Cain do? And why does he do it? Cain, now Cain talked with his brother. Now listen, God just got done talking to him. We don't know whether it was right immediately or amount of time. But at the end of the day, God talked to him. Seemed like that shit lies in your head. But this will show you how dangerous sin is. Now Cain talked with his brother Abel. And it came to pass they were in the field. That Cain rose up against his brother. Against Abel his brother. And killed him. Some folks say it was jealousy. Some folks call it transference. Cain transferred his anger. At himself. Onto his brother Abel. Who knows? People say that when you're angry, you should take a walk. You should pause. You should, as they say, slow your roll. If he had pondered a minute, if he had paused, if he had maybe reflected before acting, he might have just said, well, you know, wait a minute. What did God just tell me? He might have said, what am I, who am I really angry at? He might have asked himself, how will my family, how will mom and dad feel if I harm their child if I harm my brother the devil took great pleasure in Cain's action you know why because God blessed families because God blessed children because he commissioned and he blessed the fundamental building block of society family and in a thoughtless and a selfish act, Cain struck a blow to the family from the very beginning. Cain attacked the family structure with that fatal strike to his brother. And an emotional blow to his parents. You know, we never think about how do you think Adam and Eve felt when they knew that Abel had died. And wait a minute, not only did he die, he was killed by his brother. Unbelievable, right? We don't ever think about that. But God's mercy and his desire to bless the human family goes on. Because you see it right here in verse 10. And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from my hand. And when you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. Your days of being a farmer are over, brother. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Now listen, listen to what Cain has to say. Look, listen, when, what sin will make you do. Sin will put you so selfish and thoughtless. Now God just said all that. He just killed his brother. Listen to what Cain said. First thing come out of Cain's mouth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me uh, this day out of the, from the face of the earth. I shall be hidden from your face. I'll be a fugitive and vagabond, and it will happen that anybody who finds me will kill me. He didn't say, you know what, God, I'm sorry. He didn't say, oh, my parents. He didn't say, what? He said, wait a minute, what about me, God? You kind of hard on me, God. But look at how good God is. And the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Wow. Ain't God good? He does what we, we don't deserve. Cain didn't deserve mercy. But despite this story of sibling rivalry at its worst, fratricide, and then fratricide, that, that's just another word for siblings killing each other, murder. Despite this story of discordant families, 
We think about, despite the other stories in the Bible of, of discordant families, uh, of Joseph's ruthless brothers, right? Samson's behavior disappointing his parents. David's rapacious and rebellious children. See, despite all that, God still blesses the family. Families still make up the community. Every family has been blessed. Yet sin, all the different types of sin, a uh, child abuse and, and child neglect and child endangerment and incest and, and elder abuse and, and fights over money and, and fights over, pro despite all those type of problems, despite our egos and, and our ways, thinking mama did you better than me and, 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 and they like him better than her and, and you always had it easy and you the baby of the family, you didn't have to go through what we went through. Despite all that, despite our pride and works, all of that works to keep us from the shalom of God, the peace of God that he desires for us to have in our families. See? In our family connections. And you know what we've learned, and here's what we know as we look at God's word for the pathway and the method to construct, reconstruct, restore, and reestablish family. We look to God who, what does God do? God's so concerned about family, he's so invested in family that God so loved the world that he gave what? Somebody else's son? Somebody else's cousin? He gave his only begotten son. That who should ever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God sent a member of his family to restore us and be accepted into the family of God. Now, listen to a story that Jesus said himself about family. Just give, he wanted to give us an example of God's desire for the family. Luke 15 and 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. The young of them said to the father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falls to me. So he divided them from his livelihood. In other words, when you, you're not supposed to get your inheritance until you die. So when you come to somebody and say, Mama, Dad, I want, I want the inheritance. Now, you basically tell them, you know, I wish you was dead. Yeah. So he comes to him and asks for, for that. And the father splits it up. And then the young man goes, says, a journey to a far country where he wasted his possession in prodigal living. He went to Las Vegas, and what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, apparently. <laughs> And when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land. And he began to be in want. That ought to tell you something right there, folks. There's some people in there, boy, I wish I had that big lottery jackpot. I passed a sign and somebody won that big jackpot. And you know what, they're gonna have a whole lot of friends as long as they got that money. But as we see from this story, when the money's gone, the quote unquote friends are gone. Here he is, he done spent all that money. But nobody had nothing for him during the famine. Nobody had a morsel of bread for him. And stuff got so bad for him. And Jesus telling the story to Jewish people. He ended up at some guy's farm feeding pigs. Now they're Jewish people. You want pigs. And wait a minute. It got so bad when he was looking at what he was feeding them pigs. He thought, boy, I wish I had what these pigs had. You talk about being at the bottom of the bottom. Here's a kid from a family with some wealth. Now he's in a foreign country with no clout, no status, no money. He's doing a job that, that, that people in his own uh, 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 community would never even consider doing. And then he's looking at the food that the animals eat. And he's thinking, boy, that sure would make a good meal. Man, you know what back home, even my dad's servants, they never had a want for food. And the Bible says, and he came to himself. See, some of us got to pray, Lord, help us to come to ourselves. Because we caught up in some stuff. And stuff going on, and, and we don't see that we the problem. But he came to himself. And, and listen to how his attitude changes. He said, if I could just go to my dad and just tell him, first of all, dad, I sinned against heaven and I sinned against you. If you could just hire me 
as one of your servants. He wasn't coming back saying, hey, dad, put me back where I was. I want my position. He wasn't thinking that way. There was humility in his thinking. There was a change in his thinking. And Jesus went on to say, he went on back home and he was walking down the road. And just like any other parent, you know what your child looked like from a distance. Mother told me when I was at boot camp, his all these Marines, we all marching, perfect order. And she was looking, they were looking to see which one was me. And she said, and I saw your granddaddy's hands. And she said, I knew that was you. And this man looked from far off. That's my son. And you know what he didn't do? He didn't say, well, you know what? I'm going to just sit here and wait for him to come to me. The man got up and ran to his son and fell upon him and embraced him and accepted him back. And then he said, give me, y'all bring the robe, put the ring on my boy, y'all get that fatty calf, we gonna have us a party. My son was dead, but now he's alive. And the son was accepted. But, but there was some discord, there was some drama, right? There was some drama. The other brother said, wait a minute. I'm out here working out here in the field. What's all this party going on? Oh, well your brother's come back. And daddy done got the, your, uh, the uh, he done got, your daddy got the calf, and we had a big celebration. But I ain't going up in there. And so the daddy had to come outside and plead with him. Son, you never, look, I never always did what you said. And I never wasted your money on hogs. But that son of yours, what do you call him his brother? That son of yours did that with your money that you worked so hard for. See that drama? See that discord? Instead of the, the, the brother being, my brother's back. I, instead of him being so happy and joyful about it. See what sin will do? And then the father says, son, I love you. I'm always going to love you. But your brother was dead. And now he's back alive. Amen. That's what Jesus used that story just to show us. Because the man represented God. And God is seeking to restore a, rest of, a, restore a relationship with us. And think about who is telling the story. Now stop and think about who is telling the story. God's son was telling this story. God's son who God did not withhold but who gave to this world to reconnect to reorientate, to reapportion, to re repatriate, to re-strengthen, to resensitize, to reintegrate, to reconfirm, to regenerate, to reinforce, to reconsecrate, to reposition, to redevelop, to rethrone, to reimpair, to restore, to rehabilitate, to reconcile his prodigal family. That's us. God gave Jesus, and guess what? Jesus didn't get angry like his older brother. Why do I got to go? But instead, Jesus gave it all, friends. He gave it all on the cross. He gave it all up for peace in the family, for shalom in the family, for joy in the family, for hope in the family, for trust in the family. Jesus gave it all on the old rugged cross. He gave it all about restoring the family. We connected the community. Do you hear me? Jesus gave it up so that we could have peace in our family. Peace with your grandma. Peace with your auntie. Peace with your brother. Peace with your sister. Peace with your daddy who may have left you. He gave it all up for peace in the family. He died on that cross. Had nails in his hand. Crown of thorns on his head. Spear in his side. Nails in his feet. Blood up on that cross. And he gave it all and he died. Oh my God, Jesus died. But he got up early in the morning for the family. Yeah! You ought to say, yeah! 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 For the family. That we may be a part of God's family. That we might be accepted in the God's family in good standing and if that's the case 
how can we as a church not be for family? How can we not be for community? And that's why this is one of our methods to restore our families and our communities through prayer, service, and education. Doors of the church are open. Somebody say